Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a great pleasure, as always, to open God's Word with you in our time of worship together. Um, I thought we would uh, revisit today a text that recently came up in a course uh, that I'm teaching in uh, Second Kings. However, before I ask you to turn there, uh, I'd like to do a short New Testament reading from Matthew 18, uh, the first few verses of Matthew 18. <clears throat> in the words of our Savior, in the first five verses of that chapter, and then we'll turn to our main text in 2 Kings. Let's hear the Word of God in Matthew 18, verses 1 through 5. At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. And when I'm reading there, I'll ask you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 5, which will be our main text. And this is the narrative of the healing of Naaman's leprosy. And uh, the narrative goes on for quite a bit, maybe 20 verses. I know it's a longer scripture reading, but we'll take a moment uh, to read these verses to get a sense of the entirety of this scene and its context. So let's read 2 Kings chapter 5, and we'll read down to chapter 19 of our text. So let's hear the word of God together. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and so said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And so he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive, that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel." Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious, and he went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He'll surely come out to me, and stand and call on, on the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place, and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? And so he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then, when he says to you, Wash and be clean? And so he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him and said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant." But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And so Naaman said, Then if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth 
For your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this one thing may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the temple of Ramon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Ramon. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this matter. Then he said to him, go in peace. And so he departed from him a short distance. And we'll end our reading there. Well, in Matthew 18, uh, Jesus told us that quality of faith that he prizes the most, childlikeness. He said, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> and by this important and memorable teaching, our Savior taught us that our faith has to be meek and it has to be trusting. Our faith has to be humble. It has to be unhesitating. And that this childlikeness of faith is particularly beautiful in his eyes. He also taught us that we must be converted in order to have this quality of faith, converted by the sovereign grace of God, converted from our own pride, our own self-reliance, to the humble and trusting faith of a child of God. Now this episode from Elisha's ministry, 2 Kings chapter 5, very powerfully and poignantly illustrates these points that our Savior made. And this passage from long ago in Israel's history still today calls us to have childlike faith in the Savior. Now the teaching of this passage before us in 2 Kings takes place by way of a contrast between two characters. First of all, there's Naaman. He is identified as a Syrian general. And the passage opens up by telling us he was a great and honorable man. It goes on to say that he was a mighty man of valor. And he was prideful about who he was and where he came from. And when he encountered Elijah and his instructions, he thought that was quite beneath him. Secondly, you have this unnamed young girl from Israel who was taken captive and who served as a servant to Naaman's wife. But she has faith. She knows the true God. And there's no doubt in her mind that the God of Israel could indeed heal Naaman from his leprosy. She says so in verse 3. So the initial contrast of this passage is between a great and powerful and prideful unbeliever versus a young girl, a young servant girl. A young girl who, as a child, has childlike faith in the God of Israel and believes that the one true God of Israel can indeed heal this man from his leprosy. Now, it's important to note that the Hebrew text calls this girl a little child. Na'ara kotona in Hebrew, that's the phrase. Literally, a little child. And in the story, when Naaman finally humbles himself and he does what the prophet says, he dips in the Jordan River, Verse 14 tells us that his flesh was restored like that of a little child. Na'ar katon. The exact masculine equivalent of the description of the little girl in verse 2. Literally, our text says that he was restored like a little child. As this description is reflected in Naaman's conversion, I think the point of the story is that he became like her. Not just by the healing of his skin, but through the gift of true renewal, the conversion that gives childlike faith. And he makes this new childlike confession of faith in verse 15. Now I know there is only one God, and it's the God of Israel. And so this great, powerful, prideful man became like the little child at the beginning of the story, who directed him to the true God with childlike faith. Now, as further proof that Naaman's renewal in this passage was, was spiritual and not just physical, in verse 14, we're told that his flesh was restored to be like that of a little child. And the Hebrew text uses this verb. It's a very fascinating use of this verb. It's a verb that, it's the verb shuv in Hebrew, and it's always, almost always translated to return or to repent. It's one of the favorite verbs of the prophets. And for it to be used in this context, in this passage, 
is truly striking. It uses a verb for repentance to talk about the change of his skin to be childlike. And there's a play on this verb here. The very same verb is used in verse 14 and in verse 15. Whenever it says in verse 14 that his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, in the next verse it says, and he returned to the man of God. What's translated restored and returned are the same verb in Hebrew. And again, it's that verb shuv. It is that that big word that the prophets always use to signify a turning of repentance. So the text is telling us by using this verb that Naaman's change is a lot more than external. Something internal is going on. And when he returned to the prophet, it was to repent, wasn't it? It was to confess his newfound faith. And as I said, the same verb used to describe his repentance, his turning or returning to the prophet is the very verb used to describe the restoration of his flesh. Again, a verb almost always used by the prophets to signify repentance. Now, even more interesting, the Septuagint, or the Greek version of the Old Testament, and I wish Dr. Stuyvesant was here to hear me quote the Septuagint. <laughs> the Septuagint in this passage uses the verb epistrepho in both verse 14 and 15. And that verb is almost always translated to convert or to be converted. So the Greek text says his flesh was converted like the flesh of a little child. And in Matthew 18, that is the exact verb that Jesus used when he said, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So when Jesus said this, I think he almost certainly had in mind the story of Naaman and how it illustrates our need to become converted and to become like a little child. Naaman became like a little child as he confessed his faith and became converted. Now, it's important to understand that the healing of Naaman's leprosy in this passage was an outward illustration of the inward work of conversion. The renewal of his skin to be like the skin of a child outwardly illustrated the renewal of his heart to have childlike faith. Now, you know, very often in the Old Testament, diseases, and especially leprosy, are represented to us as an illustration of the unclean condition of the heart of mankind. And God's power to heal the body is an outward illustration of the power he has to heal the soul, to bring renewal to the inward man. And that's why Jesus went about healing all kinds of diseases in his ministry, to demonstrate and to prove that he has the willingness and the power to forgive our sins and to convert our souls and give us a greater kind of healing. And Jesus said as much in Matthew chapter 9. Just before healing a paralytic man, he said this, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. Arise and take up your bed. His healing illustrated his forgiveness and Christ's power to forgive. And that's what Naaman learned in this passage. And that's what we learn from his story, that the Lord is willing and able to forgive our sins, to restore our souls, to give us childlike faith. And that is the greater healing that we all need. Now, we've already seen how Jesus seemed to reference the story of Naaman in Matthew 18 by the connection of childlikeness and conversion. But on another occasion, Jesus referenced this story explicitly, and that was in Luke chapter 4. When Christ was opposed in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth, he was determined to go elsewhere to take his ministry and his gospel to others who would hear it. And he said to them this, upon leaving their presence, he said, Many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, uh, cleansed or made clean except Naaman the Syrian. In other words, there were many in Israel who could have been cleansed, but God chose to cleanse this foreigner, this non-Israelite man. And his point was that just as it was in Elisha's day, if his ministry was going to be rejected in Israel, that he would go to the Gentiles. And that's exactly what he did. He, went, he left from there and went to 
Galilee of the Gentiles. But the point he made is that God's grace is a sovereign grace, isn't it? He saves whom he wills to save. And it's according to his own choice and his own wisdom. And that, too, is illustrated in Naaman's story. In the story, the king of Syria sends Naaman with a letter and gifts to the king of Israel and asks him to heal Naaman. The king of Israel, who is unnamed in this passage, but we know it was Jehoram, it was Ahab's son, he tears his clothes and he says, Am I God? Can I heal someone? This man's only looking for a quarrel with me. Now, Jehoram was a prideful and evil king, and it never crossed his mind to send Naaman to the prophet Elisha. Even the young servant girl knew to do that because of her faith. But the king of Israel responded in his own childlike way, right? and not in a positive sense. He threw a temper tantrum, and he obviously had no trust in the God of Israel or his prophet. So this is the story of not one, but two powerful, prideful men. The Syrian general who is saved, but the king of Israel remains in his sins, bested by the wisdom of a little girl. The point is that God is sovereign in salvation. The Lord had chosen Naaman to be one of his children and to give him childlike faith. But he left the king of Israel in his own pride and unbelief. And the sovereignty of God and salvation is the very element of this story that Jesus underscored and emphasized in Luke chapter 4. Now, there are a few other ways that Naaman's childlike faith come out in this passage. In verses 11 and 12, he had an angry outburst at the suggestion that he dipped seven times in the Jordan River, saying that the rivers of Israel were far inferior to the rivers of Damascus. And before I pursue that point, let me take a little side point and, make, uh, I, and point out that I think what we see in the interaction between Naaman and Elisha and Naaman's servants is an illustration of the gracious simplicity of God's commands to us for our own good. In the story, he says, wash in the Jordan seven times. And Naaman thought that was ridiculously easy. He was expecting something great, something big to happen, some big command, some big ceremony, some big to do. And so he thought that was beneath him. The, 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 the prescription for his healing didn't live up to his own expectations, right? Talk about a beggar being choosers. But his servants step in at that moment and they say, look, if he had told you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? How much more just do this simple thing, what he commanded? And that turned out to be pretty wise advice. And we can turn that into an applicable point, right? What God commands us to do it's a very simple thing. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will be saved. That is the prescription for our salvation. Nothing more, nothing less. Let's apply the logic of Naaman's servants here, right? If God had commanded you to do something great, right? If he said you have to climb the highest mountain and you have to swim the farthest sea if you want to be saved, you would do it, right? To save your soul, wouldn't you? You would do that. How much more this simple thing that God commands us to do? So we don't question it. We don't, we don't scoff at it like Naaman did. We, we recognize the graciousness of the simplicity of the command, and we do it, right? Is what Naaman's servants uh, told him to do. But you have that episode in early on in the text where Naaman, he's not going to do this. This waters of Israel are far inferior to the rivers back in Damascus. He'll have none of this. But that was the old Naaman, right? After his conversion, after his confession, he asked to take these two mule loads of dirt home with him, right? Now he can't leave without taking a little bit of Israel with him. If he couldn't stay there, he's going to take some with him in order to create a suitable place in his homeland to sacrifice to the one true God. At first, he looked down on the land and the rivers of Israel. But then he couldn't leave without taking some with him. Now, this whole business of which land is better than the other, which rivers are better than the other, that, at the beginning, that was just superstitious national pride in his heart. But something changed. Psalm 102, which we sang a few moments ago, says of Zion that God's servants take pleasure in her stones. They show favor to her dust. Dust. 
And what this means is that to God's people, everything is precious about the place where God chooses to meet with his people. In the Old Testament, that was the land of Israel. But in the New Covenant, God meets with his people corporately in the church. Whenever the true church gathers, wherever it may be found throughout the world, that's where God meets with his people today. But the point we see in Naaman's story is that childlike faith produces a love for Zion and a determination to worship the true God faithfully. Naaman had to take a bunch of dirt home with him to accomplish that. But what does it look like in our lives to love Zion? Well, we need to love the church of Jesus Christ. We need to love everyone in the church of Jesus Christ, everyone. We need to be intimately concerned with and deeply involved in everything that has to do with the church with love. We need to take pleasure in her stones, show favor to her dust, as the psalm says, and be determined in our hearts to be faithful worshipers. Now, regarding Naaman's worship, our, our passage ends with a somewhat strange request, doesn't it? He requests that he be forgiven for going into the temple of Ramon with his master and uh, holding him up as he leans on his hands and so on. And it's a very puzzling uh, scene. Commentators are divided on how to understand what his request really entails and what Elisha's response to it really means. But Elisha says to him, go in peace. I think we do have to look for a positive interpretation of that. Perhaps, and it's okay to say perhaps in a sermon, you can do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, different passages admit of different interpretations within the analogy of Scripture. So uh, uh, that, that is, and this is one of those passages, I think. And I would say perhaps the prophet's permission for Naaman to do this is based on the same reasoning of Paul in 1 Corinthians 8, when he talked about eating meat sacrificed to idols. The question was, can you? Can you eat meat sacrificed to idols? And Paul said, yes, as long as you are not offending another person's conscience, because all of those false gods to which this meat is sacrificed are imaginary anyway. They do not exist. There is only one true God. So perhaps Elisha gave Naaman permission to help his master into the temple of Ramon because there is no Ramon. And how this may reflect favorably on Naaman's faith is that he was not going to worship the God of Israel and the God of Syria, which so many in the ancient world did, would worship the God of this nation and that nation. Instead, he knew that there was no God called Ramon. He confessed in verse 15, there is only one God and I am only going to worship him. But I think the main lesson is this. No matter what you think about that interaction over the temple of Ramon, the main point is this. Our faith is also bound to be challenged in the very same way that Naaman's was. He's a new believer, and he found out that the job that he had, the traditions out of which he came, the culture in which he lived, that all of these factors now presented a very difficult case of conscience. What do I do in this situation? And he did the wisest thing, which was to seek counsel. He went to the prophet Elisha seeking guidance. And that too is an element of his childlike faith. Remember, pre previously Naaman pridefully uh, pontificated to Elisha about how he was to do his job and how he expected to be healed and his advice was beneath him and so on. But now the new Naaman humbly comes back to the prophet and he asks him what to do. He seeks counsel. Well, what does that look like in our lives? Childlike faith does not rely on its own reasoning, but it seeks out the guidance of the Lord through the scriptures, first of all, but also through the counsel of our elders and through the counsel of other godly believers whom the Lord puts in our lives. I know I'm over time, uh, but permit me just a few minutes to conclude here. Um, I just want to return to this point of having childlike faith and define a little bit what it is, because we see Naaman illustrating it. We see Christ commanding us to have it. So what is it? What are the good qualities that make faith childlike? Let me suggest three things very briefly in conclusion. And those three things would be trust, dependence, and simplicity. First of all, trust. Perhaps the most basic understanding of childlike faith has to do with implicit trust. Uh, 
Children tend to be trusting. They haven't lived long enough to become uh, suspicious or cynical. Now, to be trusting in general is not in itself a virtue, but it is a key element of true faith, of childlike faith, in how we approach the Lord. And that is to say we cannot trust ourselves. We cannot trust our own thoughts, our instincts, our opinions, our inclinations. We cannot trust those. We must implicitly trust the word of our Savior without reservation, as a small child would trust what his father says to him. And that aspect of childlike faith, I think, is best summarized in Proverbs 3, verse 15. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So trust. And the second is dependence. Dependence. Uh, when we talk about childlike faith, that, of course, has reference to the parent-child relationship. That's the whole metaphor in childlike faith. And a key element there is dependence. Young children are completely dependent. Right? The IRS even calls them that on your tax forms. Dependence. That's what they are. Childlike faith highlights dependence as an element of true faith. We have to be constantly mindful of the fact that without Christ, we would be utterly lost. We would be nothing and nowhere dead in our trespasses and sins. And in this regard, we must be like children before our Heavenly Father, consciously dependent upon Him alone, always thankful for what He provides. And thirdly and finally, I would say childlike faith is a simple faith. The new believer in this passage, he didn't know much, but he knew as much as that little girl at the beginning. He knew what he said in verse 15, there is only one true God, and that's the God of Israel. Childlike faith is a simple faith. Now, this does not mean that we should be content to simply know the bare basics of the gospel without growing in knowledge. Growing in our knowledge of the truth is part of the Christian life, and it's part of our Christian duty as disciples. A disciple is a student, a learner. And there is much to learn because the truth of God is deep and it is glorious. It's not simplistic. It's not minimalist. So childlike faith isn't contentment with just a little bit of knowledge. But children may have a little bit of knowledge, but they're not content with that. They're always asking why. They're always curious. Childlike faith is equivalent to the wide-eyed wonder that always asks why, that wants to know the reason and the meaning of things. Childlike faith is an inquiring faith, but it's a simple faith. And by simple, I mean this. No matter how much you know, no matter how much you've read, no matter how much you learn in this place, or how long you have been a believer, the basic truth of the gospel, in all of its glorious, powerful simplicity, should always be at the core of your soul and not far from your mind. It should never cease to move you with wonder and with praise. The basic truth that the Son of God died for a wretched sinner like you that fact should dominate your every thought, control your thinking, and be the one truth that you live and die upon. And remember, in this world of theological innovation, simplicity is the hallmark of truth, if childlikeness is the hallmark of true faith. Trust, dependence, and simplicity. These are the elements of childlike faith that I think we see illustrated in 2 Kings chapter 5. This proud, powerful man with leprosy had not only his flesh, but his heart restored to be like that of a little child. He was humbled to trust and to depend upon the one true God with a simple and sincere faith. So examine yourself today for this childlike faith. Have you received the Lord Jesus Christ, not as a seminary student, not as a pastor, not as a theologian, but as a little child. Do you trust him implicitly? Do you depend on him entirely? Do you love him with the simplicity and sincerity of a child's love? This is the faith that Christ desires of us. And these are the ones to whom he promises the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray for this precious childlike faith that we cannot produce on our own. Only you can renew us. 
Only you can remake our hearts and give us this trusting, dependent, and simple faith in you that you desire to see. Father in heaven, give what you command. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I know we're way over time, and I apologize for that, but we can't think about childlike faith without singing Psalm 131. So let's sing 131A. Please stand.